Live from the SABC's Auckland Park studios, welcome to this week's uh, first edition of The Watchdog. My name is Vuyam Voko and on the show this evening... ...of the view that it is just and equitable that this court should order the minister to place the applicant on parole. Struggle icon Chris is convicted killer gets a get-out-of-jail-free card. The appeal is dismissed with costs. Former President Jacob Zuma may have to go back to prison. Our panel of analysts weighs in on all the attendant issues. And President Cyril Ramaphosa arrives in the United Kingdom for a state visit. Beyond the pomp and ceremony though, what's there in this visit for South Africa? All that's coming up in tonight's episode of The Watchdog, which starts right now. The Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein has ordered that former President Jacob Zuma must return to the Escort Correctional Center to finish serving his sentence. In a unanimous judgment, the SCA declared that Zuma did not lawfully complete his prison sentence. The SCA has upheld the High Court order, which declared Zuma's release on medical parole irrational, unlawful and unconditional. The appeal court says it's up to the Correctional Services Commissioner to determine whether the time spent by Zuma on unlawful medical parole should be considered in determining the remaining period of his incarceration. The appeal court ordered that if the law permits, the Commissioner may consider the disputed period when determining grounds for Zuma's release. The court has declared that former Correctional Services Commissioner Arthur Fraser was not legally permitted to release Zuma on medical parole without the positive recommendation of the Medical Parole Advisory Board. It also ruled that Fraser relied on irrelevant factors to justify his decision. Among others, Fraser considered Zuma's advanced age, his status as former head of state, and subsequent civil unrest. The SCA has further lambasted the Department of Correctional Services for releasing a media statement stating that Zuma had completed serving his sentence on the 7th of last month. This happened while the appeal court hadn't yet determined whether Zuma had lawfully completed his sentence. Zuma was handed a 15-month prison sentence by the Constitutional Court in June last year after he defied its order to appear before the State Capture Commission. The order of the judgment reads as follows. One, paragraphs five and six of the order of the High Court are set aside. Two, save for the above, the appeal is dismissed with costs. Three, the first and second appellants are ordered to pay the costs of the first, second and third respondents jointly and severally, the one paying the other to be absolved. The costs shall include the costs of two counsel. The SCA confirmed the powers of the Medical Parole Advisory Board. The board was established in 2012 to constrain what was deemed to be unfettered powers of the Commissioner of Correctional Services. The appeal court ruled that matters relating to how inmates serve their sentence, when and who qualifies for parole, should be determined by the executive of the department. The court says the matter implicates the doctrine of separation of powers. Mahala Masiteng, SABC News, Bloemfontein. 
to help us navigate some of the issues raised there. I'm joined in studio by advocate Mbilo Ntle Baloi from the Church Square Society of Advocates. He's also an advocate of the High Court. On the line, we have Dr. Mkuseli Vimba, who is an independent political and legal analyst. Good evening to both of you gentlemen, and thanks very much um, for your time. If I'm going to start with you, I'm an advocate. I remember when the ruling came out uh, earlier today, uh, among the first points of debate was whether the former president will indeed have to go back to a correctional facility. And the ruling is unambiguous on that one, isn't it? Um, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Look, the, the ruling is unambiguous on that one, but um, if we look at the judgment in its totality and uh, what Justice uh, Tatima Kuha said, uh, pretty much throws back the ball into the uh, court of the uh, correctional services in, in, in determining what the, how, or rather how President Zuma will serve the remainder of the sentence. So if we look at it from the beginning, yes, he served uh, about two and a half months of the sentence, and um, uh, the parole board granted him a, a parole. And what, what is at stake now, and what the court had to decide upon, is whether was the granting of the parole lawful and rational? It's, it is the was not the, the Correctional Services Commissioner yes. that let him go, not the board. Correct. Yeah, the board um, made a recommendation which the commissioner went against. Exactly, and uh, th that was the medical uh, uh, advisory uh, division of, of the parole board that said that, and which is a specialist body, mm. that said under these conditions, this, sh this should not be the case. Mm. But um, the National Commissioner then uh, proceeded to uh, uh, let him go on that parole. Mm. And that now became a debate of power as to mm. whether the decisions of the National Commissioner can actually override that of the advisory board. Mm. And Dr. Vimba, I mean, the um, uh, former Commissioner of Correctional Services came under fire for bringing up irrelevant, um, you know, reasons uh, for deciding the way um, he, he, he decided. But also uh, uh, from that piece uh, that uh, played, uh, my colleague also pointing out um, um, that he actually uh, usurped the powers of the, of the, of the board. Yeah, he's, he's, he's frozen. Uh, now, w among the things that, I mean, the, 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 that were pointed out was that um, um, the, the former Correctional uh, Services Commissioner, um, one, went against, which is a point we, 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 we touched on that now, ju just now. Uh, but also, I mean, as uh, Berlin says, he brought into, uh, as a basis of his decision, uh, things that were not relevant? Sure. Um, look, we, we would have to, to look at the entire recommendations um, of the Medical Advisory Board mm -hmm. and say this is what they had said and this was what was actually considered. Mm -hmm. And the main basis for the release of President uh, Zuma was um, upon his uh, medical condition, mm -hmm. uh, which we, we were made to believe still subsists, it still continues, it's, it's still an existing position. So um, in determining that and going against, so the, the gist of it is that going against the decision of the advisory board was the incorrect thing that the commissioner had done. Mm. Therefore, the court then says that indeed, then President Zuma needs to save the remainder of his sentence. And the problem also being that um, the portion of his sentence that was saved um, up to September, which would mark it the end, was served during the process of the appeal being ongoing. Mm. Therefore, by virtue of that, the court then says no. Um, you, he must then save, serve the remainder of the, this sentence, which would be about 11 or 12 odd months. Mm. But as to how he serves that mm. remainder of the it sentence, will be at the discretion it will be at the discretion of the commissioner. Mm. Now, 
if it's sent back to the same commissioner uh, 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 that, that uh, uh, ruled um, otherwise or rather ruled in favor of, pre of uh, President Zuma, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting what result we can then anticipate from that mm. um, as to which way this thing would, would swing. Mm. But again, beyond that, uh, this is in the Supreme Court of Appeal and there's still um, another uh, bite on the cherry, uh, being that it, 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 it can still be taken on appeal to the Constitutional Court. Mm. And pending that uh, procedure of taking it to the Constitutional Court, uh, President Zuma will still be out, outside. So. Um, it's two things now that we need to consider. Um, what the, the commissioner will, will decide as to how he will serve the remainder and uh, uh, procedural processes insofar as the con going to the constitutional court is concerned. And w which is also interesting also because... Going back to the constitutional court. Going back to court, the constitutional, the constitutional court, court because that decided it today. came, yes, um, the, 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 the contempt proceedings mm. took place in the constitutional court. Mm. So now it would also be interesting to, to see that how will the constitutional court now uh, decide in this particular one? Mm. Uh, Dr. Viamba, I mean, he, what I was asking you earlier was, uh, uh, you know, some of, some of the stuff that came out um, being that... Um, the former Correctional Services Commissioner relied on irrelevant factors um, to justify his decision, um, like the age and status of the, of the, of the former president. Yes, yes, uh, you are correct. The, the, the court made it clear that, uh, in fact, before we were expecting the court to pronounce on whether Arthur Fraser had the power uh, to overrule uh, the, the the board. I think my colleague, uh, my colleague, has just expressed and emphasised that uh, the this panel of ten is a panel of experts. So the court then uh, finds that the Arthur Fraser acted ultra virus. He did not have the powers to. To, to overrule the parole board. But if it was before 2012, mm -hmm. when one medical doctor would make a recommendation and it's carried out, mm -hmm. then that would be a total different story. Mm -hmm. But at this point in time, Atta Fraser uh, acted unlawfully and his decision is unlawful and invalid. Then so. Well, on that one then, on that one, um, is there then no argument to be made so to remember, that, hey, the former president didn't just walk out of, you know, the correctional facility. Someone, he thought, actually had the power and authority to take the decision he took, did so. And that's how he got out of there. Uh, that's correct. That's where the issue of... Um a principle, the principle of W J party comes in because the law is very clear to say that you cannot be punished twice for one and the same mm. offence, and it was not uh, his prerogative that he is out of jail. Mm. Someone else uh, faltered, and uh, he was released on bail. Therefore, it's not. Um, it, it can be his argument to say that I never walked out of, mm. of jail on my own. Mm. Someone whom I believed to have the powers released me. Whether the person, that person did that correctly or wrongly, that's not my case. All what I'm, I'm saying is that I was supposed and I went out of prison due to that decision or based on that decision. Mm. So meaning that at the end of the day, it's not his fault, but... The most important thing is that he is the one who was uh, sentenced. Mm. So at the end of the day, if we have been taken out of jail unlawfully and that decision is rendered invalid, therefore you still have to serve your sentence. But in this case, as my learned colleague has, has indicated, the, the court did not make pronouncement on that. Mm -hmm. It's left to the, to, the, to the correctional services to make a determination. And I'm sure that the period that is spent outside will be taken into consideration because it, he was not a free man. His rights were, rights were limited. Then on the basis of that, I believe 
that um, that will be taken into consideration by correctional services. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the SA also I mean, criticized the uh, department, the correctional services department, for releasing that media statement that said the former president had completed um, 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 his uh, uh, sentence and therefore was a free man. Is that, yes, will that are... still be relevant, uh, 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 advocate? You know, that's very much <clears throat> relevant because, in essence, he has served his sentence. Uh, because, remember, he, he was not free. He was under parole, and parole is not uh, absolute freedom. Mm. So um, w the interesting part is that the subsequent judgments, including the one of today, mm. um, they are likely to become moot or rather academic in nature. Mm. Because, yes, they can stick and say, you know, okay, fine, this is what the court has pronounced. But, in essence... Uh, th th this man has been under uh, uh, correctional services for the past 15 months mm. and now he comes back and says I'm free mm. and uh, uh, what my colleague is now saying is very much correct that uh, the ball now being thrown back in, into the court of the correctional services they will then have to take into consideration undoubtedly mm. uh, uh, the period also served in parole and um, hence I say that um, the judgment is likely to become moot likely or will it? Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating <laughs> because we don't, know, we don't know which direction uh, uh, President Zuma and his uh, legal team will decide to go. But um, uh, uh, undoubtedly, uh, it, this might uh, end up being like another Facebook post or a tweet. Mm -hmm. If that is the case then, uh, Dr. Vimba, what would be the significance of today's judgment? If, yeah. if, if it did, I mean, as advocate is saying, uh, in all likelihood, uh, this today's exercise may well be academic. Uh, it may well be academic, provided that the Department of Correctional Services says, no, the president, former president has served the sentence. Mm. And um, taking that into account because in reality, what is in condition is uh, just uh, one year, uh, 15 months, uh, one year or one and a half years. Then he served two months instead of three months. Mm. So the question then is whether will it make sense to send the former president back to prison for one month? And um, the, the answer then lies with the Department of Correctional Services to say, no, the, the principle of WHO party, this person cannot be punished twice. He cannot, because he was not free. Mm. Then that would be adding to the sentence and uh, that has been uh, cramming, that has been given by the court. So on the basis of that, let's consider the time that he spent outside on parole because he was not a free man. His rights were limited. He could not do as he pleases. Therefore, on the basis of that, then we set him free. Then the unfortunate part of it, as the court said, is that uh, the, the department has already pronounced that he or he has already made a decision to say that he is now a total free man. Mm -hmm. He has finished his sentence. And the gripe on the part of the court is to say the matter was sub to decay and the department was also an, an applicant mm -hmm. in this matter. So it was really unfortunate for the department to say. Then the question, as my colleague has said, will the same department that has pronounced that is a free man uh, take him back to jail? So uh, I, I doubt very much, but let's give them an opportunity to read the, the judgment as they uh, requested, give them the space and see what will be their decision. So a lot, I mean, it depends. Um, on what correctional services has to say, but also subsequent to that, what um, the former president's uh, team, legal team, uh, will, will then decide to do. Well, in Johannesburg, the Constitutional Court ordered that a struggle icon Chris and his murderer, Janusz Walus, be released on parole. Walus has spent the past 28 years in jail for the 1993 killing of the former general secretary of the South African Communist Party. The Constitutional Court, in a unanimous judgment, has ruled that convicted murderer Janusz Walus be released on parole within 10 days.
The Apex Court found that the decision by Justice Minister Ronald Lamola to deny Walus parole in 2020 was irrational. Walus, a Polish immigrant, shot and killed then South African Communist Party Secretary General Chris Harney in 1993 at the cusp of South Africa's realization of democracy. Hani's murder shook the country with fears that his death would lead to a civil war. Walus previously made five applications for parole and says he was reformed. The decision of the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services made in March 2020 rejecting the applicant's application for parole is reviewed and set aside. B. The Minister of Justice and Correctional Services is ordered to, to place the applicant on parole on such terms and conditions as he may deem appropriate and to take all such steps as may need to be taken to ensure that the applicant is released on parole within 10 calendar days from the date of this order. The decision left Chris Honey's widow, Dimpo Honey, outraged. This country is finished. Where in this country, a foreign white can come into South Africa, kill my, kill my husband. I don't know if you had, Zondo never referred to my family, to myself, to my children, and the trauma and the suffering. He couldn't give a Sorry for my French. He couldn't be bothered. The Ministry of Justice says that it would consider the judgment and comply. In the minister's decision, he really did take, take into consideration the nature and the seriousness of the crime. And that's important because it did have a particular context to it. And it, you know, when taking a decision of this nature, you want to ensure that the ramifications of that decision in society as well do not cause some level of uncertainty. And I think that is why the minister took the nature of the decision, the nature of the crime into consideration. For instance, when you release a murderer back into society, you have to really consider whether the community would really be able to reaccept that person. Uh, and in this instance, that's definitely a factor that the minister took into place, into consideration. Furthermore, members of the South African Communist Party say the next step is to mobilize. We will have to go to the drawing board to, uh, to see how to remobilize society uh, on a matter of uh, justice for the people, not justice for criminals. Uh, because we believe that today, uh, indeed, um, in the court of justice, an injustice has occurred. The Ministry of Justice has not elaborated on the details surrounding the parole process yet. The wounds of the past are reopened with the South African Communist Party arguing that the court failed to protect its rights to exist as communists, now forcing them to protect those rights themselves. Kani Mapanga, SABC News, Johannesburg. Advocate Bolo, your thoughts? You know, um, on this one. Honestly, this is a, a quite an emotional one um, for for the country as a whole. Um, if we consider the happenings of um, 1993, the murder of Chris Hani, um, a freedom fighter, an anti-apartheid activist. I mean, we we need to take it back from there and uh, come with it. And almost uh, three decades later. We are still sitting here with the convicted murderer uh, of that particular atrocity. And um, <clears throat> look, considering it legally and um, in the interest of justice, um, we will remember that the initial sentence to this gentleman, to, to, together with his colleague that later passed on, uh, it was a death sentence. This was essentially supposed to be a death sentence uh, pre the 1996 constitution which we have today which was uh, ch changed pretty much in 1990 the 1995 judgment of state versus Maguanyan, uh, where the court took the counter majoritarian premise and uh, ruled that the death penalty uh, it will then be abolished and will no longer be applicable therefore that death sentence was now converted to a life sentence and um, in so far as that is concerned Many considerable uh, factors were, were taken into account in that particular sentence. But as the, as the Chief Justice pointed out today, he did qualify for parole 15 years ago, actually. That is very much correct. And um, what the minister said in, in, in 2020 was rather that we must take the averments of the court of first instance that uh, convicted this man. Uh, considering the, and setting an example that the murder of political, uh, the murder and assass assassination of political leaders will not be tolerated 
the seriousness of the crime. And the Chief Justice, even today, went back to those facts and in, in indicating that this was uh, just pre-democracy. And clearly, there was an intention, perhaps, to even delay democracy. Those are considerable things to, to, to think of and very much notable. But now, within a legal system and the constitutional democracy that we have, which uh, uh, Janus Walus is also subjected to, what does that then mean? Does that then mean that he is not entitled to the same rights um, as a normal South African? Yeah. By the way, he had dual citizenship mm. to South Africa until 2017 when it was revoked. Um, his colleague uh, got parole but died, died of cancer the following year. So in, consider in considering, and now if we're going to mirror this to the uh, uh, Zuma matter, and considering the processes of parole as a whole, yes, he did qualify. But if we look at where we are as a country, if we consider the, 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 the happenings of the past and what actually took place, um, that, that's what actually delayed his, his release. Mm. And to indicate that the death of Chris Honey almost plunged us into po uh, 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 political and social unrest mm. in South Africa. So those are considerations. And uh, the court then says today that those factors, as important as they are, those cannot be the only considerations in considering whether this man should be released on parole or not. Mm -hmm. Now, when we consider the parole, we must look at it as, <coughs> consider him as an ordinary mm -hmm. uh, 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 South African and member of society and within the confines mm -hmm. of the qualifications of parole. No, uh, listen, your very last point is very interesting. And I'll come back to sure. uh, uh, that is Dr. Vimba, your thoughts on this one? Uh, uh, thanks for your the, the decision of the Constitutional Court. I would say that um, it's legally sound, but a uh, very bitter um, pill to swallow. Mm. Uh, I think my friend has just alluded to where we come from as the country, the role that uh, Christiane played in bringing about the democracy that we are in. but. My, my, my take to it is that uh, the, the court had no other option but to release him on bail, be, taking into account that we have the laws in South Africa that needs to be respected. And anything that the court does, then it must take consideration of the current pieces of legislation that we have, which in essence allowed uh, the Yalus Walus to be released on bail. And taking into account that uh, he had previously tried to be released on bail, but he failed in court. So I understand, uh, I fully understand where the family comes from with all the utterances. But at the end of the day, the court was faced with one option, but to consider the, to consider the law and make a determination based on, the, on what the, the, the pieces of legislation provide. So on the basis of that, for me, it is a sound uh, legal decision, but politically it's, it's really difficult uh, for, for everyone. Uh, does that matter, though, um, um, Dr. Vimba? Shouldn't the law be blind? <laughs> yes, the law should be blind, as I'm saying, that uh, we, we need to accept the decision of the court because I don't see how else they would have dealt with the matter other than releasing Yolu Yaluswalus. And the other thing uh, that we also need to take into consideration, even if we did not have today's judgment, he is left, I think, with one and a half years before he is, finishes his sentence. What happens in, in, in a space of one and a half years, he would be out. And what other means were we, were we going to utilize or use to take him back to jail? None. So hence I'm saying that the, the court, I think uh, it's correct in its decision, but as we know that we have suffered as black people in bringing about, the, 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 um, in bringing about democracy, then hence for I'm saying that if there are things that are still not said about the killing of uh, our hero, then it, it becomes difficult for people because they say they have unanswered questions. Well, and I'd those questions... 
uh, will remain an unsigned. I, I don't know though about the year being left, you know, <laughs> before he finishes serving his sentence because similar arguments are being raised about the, the whole uh, suspended public protector issue, but I'm not going to go there sure. <laughs> um, um, right now. But I mean, in the course of all the discussions, debates, and the conversations that have been going on, uh, I mean, this, this afternoon on the back of this, I mean, the people who are raising the fact that, you know, Eugene de Kock, Mr. Prime Evil himself, uh, was paroled under the, incidentally, uh, Jacob Zuma administration. So why are we choosing enemies? No, and that is very much correct. And look, um, we, we need to be very realistic and uh, uh, true to what is currently happening. Where do we come from as a country? Uh, what does the constitution mean? What is the essence of constitutional democracy? And so on. So the death of uh, Chris Honey indeed uh, is, is, is something which is very emotional. If you listen to the comments of um, his, 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 his widow, uh, the South, South African Communist Party, Solima Paila said quite a mouthful uh, in, in, in that uh, the, 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 the SACP needs to mobilize and, and so on. But in essence, what does that mean? And uh, are we moving forward as a democracy? Are we moving forward as a country? Um, if we keep going back to, to these issues. Um, if, if you look at the whole uh, issue of, for example, the, the, the TRC, what are the implications of uh, that and the, and, and the evidence that was led there and the things that came from that? And if we're going to move as a rainbow nation, if we're going to move towards a dispensation of healing, what does that actually entail if we are going to keep going back to, to these things? And equally, if it's released tomorrow, and they, clearly, the family is still aggrieved. Clearly, the SACP is still aggrieved. <laughs> what would that mean for his security? Mm -hmm. you know, uh, do we consider such things as well? At the same time, we need to balance such things to his rights. What is he entitled to as, as a citizen or as an inmate mm -hmm. in South Africa uh, and within the confines of the laws of South Africa? Because we must understand that the law is the law. And as you correctly said, the law should be blind. And the law is not a jacket that you can wear when it's cold and remove uh, when it's hot. And can I also add that it shouldn't be about who reads the judgment uh, or who form part of the panel, because that too came out. Because, I mean, emotional as she was, um, uh, that is Chris and his widow, also Stimpo, um, you know, and a lot of people actually empathized with her. But, uh, you know, uh, some of the things she said about the... Chief Justice, for yes. example, you know, that it's no coincidence, you know, that uh, on the one hand, you have a Jacob Zuma who's being uh, uh, asked to, or who may be asked to uh, go back to a correctional facility. And on the other hand, you have uh, at the Constitutional Court, the Chief Justice saying, you know, <laughs> no, you know uh, this guy must be paroled. I agree. I agree with you. And um, she said quite a mouthful, um, especially that, um, look, we, we, we have you as a Chief Justice there today because there were freedom fighters mm -hmm. like the late Chris Harney mm -hmm. who has fought to ensure that mm -hmm. these things do actually happen. But now also we need to also look at uh, judicial security and judicial independence. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with what I mentioned earlier on with the Makwanyane judgment of 1995 that abolished the death penalty. Mm -hmm. the, the, the word on the street and even today if we were to take a poll was that the death penalty should continue. Mm. The death penalty is the way to go. That's what the public was saying. But the court took a counter-majoritarian decision to say that this would be the right to life and it, it would be safeguarded in this particular way. And we need to also understand that we cannot compare... Yeah, but policy preceded that. Indeed. You know, that would accept as a country we are abolishing the, 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 the death penalty. Correct. So it's not like a court sat and said... It, this is what's going to happen. Indeed, but now if what I'm trying to show you is that sometimes uh, the court needs to close its ears to, 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 to uh, popular sentiment and focus solely on the law uh, as to this is how things will, will proceed, this is how things will, will be done. And it also speaks to judicial independence. And that by no means takes away also, I mean, from the pain that you know um, you know people feel about what happened to uh, their to their loved ones as i said in the beginning yeah. that it's an emotional judgment considering where we come from
But in considering where we are going and being futuristic, look, we don't have today the, the benefit of a crystal ball mm. in front of us to ha ha help us determine what will happen tomorrow, how will the country react. Mm. But if we're going to speak of reconciliation, rainbow nation, unity in diversity, and all these beautiful things that the Constitution prescribed, mm. is this release of Wanus Jalus at least not even half a step mm. towards the progressive realization of that ideal? Mm. To end this, um, Dr. Vimba, um, people saying, hey, um, you know, what um, we may see out of this or on the back of a, um, a ruling on the former president, what we saw, um, the unrest that we saw, people are saying we don't know what could happen to uh, this guy once he, I mean, Janusz Walusz, when he comes out of uh, uh, a prison. Just, just your thoughts. Uh, uh, thanks for your. I, I think the I fully understand the the, the anger and the pain uh, that uh, the family is going through. But I think I align myself with my colleague to say that uh, we just need to move on as the country because mobilizing people uh, to do what and um, and uh, also talking. Um, um, uh, uh, the way the, the family talked about the, the judiciary. Those things are the ones that um, are, are holding the country back. Mm -hmm. we, we, we should move. We should, uh, especially uh, now that Yalus uh, Walus have been uh, trying to reach out to the family to, to apologize and say sorry for his actions. Uh, for me, that should be one of the important things that the family should consider and, um, and just uh, leave it at where it is. The, 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 we all feel the pain, but at the end of the day, it is very important that we, we move forward as a country. We don't have to, to hold back on things or on the past. Mm -hmm. Then the rape on ancient that the, 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 my colleague is talking about, Okay, let's also leave it there, uh, Dr. Vimba. Uh, Dr. Vimba, an independent political and legal analyst, and with me in the studio, thanks to you too, Advocate Baloy, who is, of course, a member of the Church Square Society of Advocates. After the break, President Cyril Ramaphosa arrives in the United Kingdom for a state visit. But beyond the pomp and ceremony, what's there in this visit for South Africa? Energy, health, science and technology will be high on the agenda when President Cyril Ramaphosa and King Charles III meet at Buckingham Palace tomorrow. The president arrived in London this morning, accompanied by several cabinet ministers uh, as well as a business delegation. London, the world's financial capital, the capital of the fifth largest economy. It's this city which will host President Cyril Ramaphosa, who's been invited by the newly crowned king to Buckingham Palace. He may have arrived to a wet and chilly UK, but talks will surely be characterized by warm engagements. After all, these are old allies whose relations remain intertwined. Our president uh, is very pleased to have the opportunity to indicate to His Majesty the very strong collaboration that exists between South Africa and the United Kingdom and to uh, emphasize uh, new areas of cooperation that I know His Majesty would have a great interest in, such as the uh, a just energy transition plan uh, of which the United Kingdom is one of the uh, international partners. The president arrives in UK while the country battles rolling blackouts. Something certain to form part of the talks as the country seeks to boost its energy capacity. The country will also be hoping Britain makes good on its promise after pledging $8.5 billion along with its allies US and the EU countries for a just energy transition. The UK's exit from the EU has prompted an even greater need for the country to increase trade elsewhere.
With its advanced infrastructure, South Africa remains the gateway to the continent for many countries. Our scientists have collaborated uh, very smartly uh, with respect to COVID-19 uh, variants and other areas of uh, biotechnology where we cooperate. Uh, the headquarters of the Square Kilometre Array are in the United Kingdom and our scientists are working together to build that mega uh, radio telescope. So there are, you know, I think uh, key areas uh, that we will uh, uh, give emphasis to uh, during the course of the visit. You will see uh, events that the president will attend, uh, accompanied by other ministers, accompanied, by, I'm sure, by other members of the royal family, that will tell a story about the economic partnership between our countries, but also uh, partnerships in areas like health, science and innovation, education, research, skills. Uh, as the two countries, we work very, very closely together on these topics looking to deliver inclusive economic growth in both countries, jobs and investment for both countries. As is tradition, there will be pomp and ceremony to mark the visit, but beyond that, substance will be the order of the day when President Ramaphosa meets his British counterpart and address a business gathering of the two countries. Not only is UK renowned for its architectural history, it's also been central in the creation of Western culture something not lost to South Africa as it seeks to exploit opportunities and benefits presented by this global power. Mzondi Lembej, SABC News, London. My guests for this conversation are Professor David Munyai, who is Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Charles Singala is an independent international relations expert. Good evening to both of you gentlemen. Thanks very much uh, for your time. I want to start with you, uh, Prof. Munyai, if I may. First world leader to be hosted by the new king. Does that mean anything? Should we read anything to it? Or does it happen to be a mere coincidence? I would say yes uh, and no. Um, firstly, uh, uh, this was on the books uh, before COVID and um, the late uh, Queen, uh, when, when she passed away, uh, it also delayed and now the new King uh, has to kickstart and, and one can imagine will take anything according to schedules uh, but it, 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 it also quite uh, important, I think, for him to have a black president, an African in particular, uh, instead of the usual um, suspects um, such as Canada, Australia, uh, your Anglo kind of uh, setting. I think it will, uh, he will score more points uh, in terms of the uh, the look of it and, and the substantive issues that they're going to discuss, given the fact that this is the beginning of a monarchy uh, of uh, King Charles III and, uh, and also a new beginning for a new prime minister. And therefore, I think these meetings will be critical to both leaders in, in the two countries. Dr. Sengala, I mean, uh, the both, uh, I mean, King Charles and, um, uh, and his predecessor, you know, um, his, his mother, uh, were and are ceremonial heads of state. So should we really read much or put a great deal of emphasis on that particular uh, a meeting done with Reggie Sunak, for example, the prime minister? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me and good evening to your viewers. Uh, thank you for the professor to highlight exactly the cause of the meeting. Uh, but uh, I have a different uh, perspective in terms of the meetings that has been called not by the South African government, but the government of the United Kingdom, as it has been. See, we haven't forgotten that uh, all former colonies of the British are still subservient and answerable to the United Kingdom, the supreme leaders who has negotiated uh, their way to pursue the new colonialism on the African continent. So we shall have seen uh, our leaders leave our places of governance, even if we have the funeral at home. Last time I checked that uh, uh, in African setup and tradition, in one does not leave their house when there's a funeral to go and attend another funeral. 
you can only leave once your funeral has been spashed for you to go and attend another funeral. Uh, yes, uh, President Sir Ramaphosa, of course, uh, Prof, I can correct you there, but he's not the only black leader uh, that uh, King Charles has met. Also, the president of Zambia, Haka in the Ichilema, uh, visited uh, uh, past his coronation as a king of the United Kingdom. Uh, president Sir Ramaphosa was also invited and called to be convinced uh, regarding the war in Ukraine and Russia, he was in the United States of America during the passing of uh, King Charles' mother, uh, Queen Elizabeth. He did not attend. I think uh, this could be a chance and opportunity uh, for him to go and attend. I'm surprised that uh, President Cyril has taken almost all his cabinet uh, to go and uh, attend this occasion. You know, uh, I do not know where African leaders are going, you know, since the relationship and bilateral. Yes, uh, uh, Minister Naledi Pando has mentioned the achievement or advantages of bilateral relationships uh, between South Africa and the United Kingdom. But we only see this on the one-sided side. Is it a possibility that... Uh, uh, there is a chance that we've got ShopRite in the United Kingdom. Is there a possibility that we've got Chisanyama in the United Kingdom? Is there a possibility that we've got the local entrepreneurs who are accessing the United Kingdom market? I shall leave that point to this point as we discuss further. Professor Munyai, uh, I mean, is it, is, it, is it all that bad? Uh, not at all. I think uh, if you look at international relations, the art of foreign policy, it's a give and take. Uh, in this case, South Africa has a number of issues that it has to advance. Foreign policy is nothing else other than the advancement of your national interest. In this case, South Africa has a number of challenges that it faces. Not only the load shedding, uh, unemployment is very high on health and a number of other areas and the call for investments in this country and on the African continent. We have a crisis in Zimbabwe that UK is critical to the end of those sanctions in, in Zimbabwe. So this is in South Africa's interest to ensure that you discuss with uh, both um, the monarchy as well as the prime minister um, to ensure that uh, UK play and it could play a critical role in easing some of the pressures that we have. And in return, UK needs South Africa. It's a 50-50, um, a two-way uh, street, of course, the powers are not equal. UK is yes, because I mean, as, as as things stand, I mean, the trade is skewed heavily in favour of Indeed. of the UK. Indeed. But Sangala, so I mean, we... I, I want to I take you back, though, Dr. Sangala, to uh, I mean, the point you raised earlier, um, asserting that we are still beholden um, to our you know uh, former colonial masters, but in very practical and perhaps new ones. Okay. Uh, just pack the looking for or search for investments going forward, but just going backwards a little. Uh, in what ways? In, in what ways? And so, like, are, are we still? Oh, you know, are we seeing this that uh, uh, these former colonies are still, you know, to their colonial masters? Well, uh, you must remember the agitators of the independence of the Af. African continent, not to win, you know, outrightly that we became in charge of our political and economic and social activities of our countries. There was an agreement, a negotiations in South Africa, you call it truth and reconciliation, uh, that uh, terms and conditions were attached to what they discussed uh, for them to relinquish the power. So it is not uh, something that uh, we have to forget about. We can see what happened in uh, uh, Zimbabwe, just next door there in, uh, in, uh, in uh, South Africa. Um, the agreement with the Robert Gabriel Gabriel, may he's for rest in peace, that uh, the colonial masters shall continue collecting the colonial tax until uh, 2000, which was an agreement and they entered into agreement and they got the political power. But uh, when Tony Blair came as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, he refused what his predecessor enshrined uh, into the agreement. 
happen, uh, that they should stop by the year 2000. Hence, you have seen what has happened in Zimbabwe. It is unfortunate that we do not see these facts, but these are things that are happening. And the, the core for what you've likely said and discussed with the professor, that uh, UK stands in a position to assist Africa from coming out of the slumber and difficulties and poverty and unemployment or whatever the dispensation, what is happening, it is not the UK who's going to assist. In fact, those United Kingdom, United States of America and other other multinational is that we feel that they're going to assist us. They are not going to assist us because they are part of the system that fuels poverty on the African continent. To them, it adds on to their GDP. Africa but though, but though, uh, uh, at... but Osengal, I mean, is it is it their fault or ours uh, that we don't sit around the table as equals and insist? Um, uh, on the things that make sense to us. And if things don't make sense to us, then we don't honor um, these, these invitations. Isn't that as simple as all that? Why do we have to keep blaming them? Well, it looks simple, but it's not simple. Yes, we, we no longer blame the thief from stealing our laptop in the house. We blame the one who left the door open uh, to the thief to access easily. Uh, those uh, conventions that I mean conventions and agreements that they signed, you know, prior to the independence and the relinquishing of their territorial um, areas, you know, still abound, including the Francophone countries. Uh, it is there. They are worth as uh, stationed by their estral colonizers, the France. That's why they do not have a say. It is a call that they call the president of South Africa to come and meet the king with all his cabinet, so that they can introduce them to how the system works. The new prime minister as well has been installed in the United Kingdom, as well as there must be that relationship for them to pursue. They cannot say no until Africa says, let's have a meeting, let's have the prime minister uh, in South Africa, let us discuss issues that can be beneficial for both of us. Well, but well, there is a, a superiority complex among the heads of states and government uh, where they feel that President Cyril Ramaphosa has head of state and government of South Africa is lower than the prime minister, also who is equivalent to the head of states and government in the set of the United Kingdom. Well, when I was saying, when I was saying, I mean, uh, uh, when I was asking rhetorically, of course, uh, whether we should blame them for, uh, 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 you know, us uh, staying on a relationship that just doesn't make sense. I wasn't, I wasn't saying we shouldn't blame them or they are not guilty of looting and plundering our resources for many, many, I mean, for hundreds of years. But what I was, what I was asking was whether it made sense then if the uh, 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 meetings and relationships are not beneficial official why should we blame someone else for staying in those in those uh, 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 relationships I don't know what your thoughts are on this one uh, professor Mian no, well we, mu we must blame we must blame ourselves mm. for finding ourselves in that situation mm. there's always time that we can come out from that slumber exactly. and stand at the discussion you know, with the, our colleagues as diplomatic mission, as per 1961 Vienna uh, Convention, uh, which clearly recognize the sovereignty of countries, you know, but our leaders do not behave like that, that they have to be respected. Mm -hmm. I see some of them even down to other heads of states on the other side. Mm -hmm. But uh, having said that, you know, diplomatic relationships for countries is very important on the continent and outside. Uh, like what the professor said, we all exist as a unity in the world. We, as we exchange our bilateral and multilateral relationships and as well as business. My only call is it has to be mutual. You know, when we allow the UK to trade, we also must allow the South Africans or the Africans at large Okay. On the other side. Uh, we, 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 lo we lost you. We lost you there, Dr. Singala. Uh, last word from you, uh, Prof. Will any good come out of uh, uh, this visit from your vantage uh, point? This, I think here yeah, you're going to have a number of issues where UK uh, needs us help from South Africa. It has left the European Union and therefore their number of core interests where South Africa's and UK interests converge 
And obviously, there are so many areas where uh, our interests diverge, and it is important for South Africa uh, sorry, not to rely only on Western countries. You need to balance. We have relationship with other countries uh, in the world, uh, Russia, China, Japan, United States, and therefore, I think we need to balance um, our friends. Special thanks to both of you, Professor David Munyai, Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg, and Dr. Charles Singala, who is an independent international relations expert. That's our show for tonight. Do join us again tomorrow evening, same time. Have a good night.